In this episode of the Orange Nerd Show, we are joined by the one, the only, Mr. Matthew Murr, all the way from the UK. We're talking animation today. We've got a lot of spicy topics up next here on the Orange Nerd Show. Welcome aboard, everybody, to another episode of the Orange Nerd Show. Here on the Orange Nerd Show, we talk about everything revolving the Disney company, but that's not theme park. So we talk about the studio side. Uh, we talk about like Marvel, you know, Star Wars, all that good stuff. We also talk about the corporate side too, very much so in terms of like you know the the proxy fights and all that good stuff. So before we get into our festivities, the Italiano is joining us today, looking super dapper as usual. George, welcome back, sir. <laughs> Thank you very much. Glad to be on. And uh, again, always glad to uh, talk shop with you guys. So it's going to be great. Yeah, absolutely. If you could let everybody at home know where they could find you on uh, social media. Absolutely. You could find me on X, formerly known as Twitter, at Disney George. You could also find me on Instagram under the Disney Italiano. And of course, you'll find me here on my home base at Orange Grove 55 with Citrus Corner with all that sweet, juicy, but sometimes sticky disney news and info there he is mr the mr mr italiano in the house and <laughs> last but certainly not least we got our good friend mr matthew murr um like i said all the way from the uk matthew i Thanks just want to say back on. absolutely matthew we, we love having you on and i, I just want to say again i do we do appreciate you we do know there is a massive time difference so it's later for you and uh we do appreciate you coming on and, and talking shop with us but uh if you could let everybody at home know where they can find you on social media matthew you can find me on Instagram under the name Matthew Thomas Muir, and you can now find me on X again. There I'll is. I'll put the link in the, in the description below. Yeah, the link. Yes, absolutely. The link will be in the description below, one hundred percent. So let's go ahead and dive into the festivities. Now, these three topics were were chosen by Matthew. So very, very good topics. They're they're animation related. So it's an all animation show. Topic number one: Should Disney consistently remain on a path of having more and more complex stories? And characters, or can it deviate back to simpler ones like those like those flicks made pre nineteen eighty nine? So we are seeing in this in this question, we are seeing more complex stories. Like a Frozen two is much more complex than a lot of the older yeah. films. You know what I'm saying? There's and we started stories. to see this as early as the late eighties and early nineties because Ariel was there was considerably more competent for lack of a better word, princess than the previous ones. And the Beast was shown to what going to be what they would call an anti-hero or an anti-villain the likes of which were only really brought about by star wars that's true that's very very true so you you do you think we can go back to these simpler movies or do you think that audiences have kind of evolved matthew where we can't I'm go not back sure if we can, to be honest yeah it, it's tough it's tough and we're also seeing in terms of like more complexity you know back in the day you know back in Walt's day we would see very clear-cut villains in these movies you know when when you watch the sleeping beauty you know who the bad you know the the villain is immediately you know what i'm saying and a lot of these Walt era movies were like that with the new movies you don't really know you know with frozen you don't know who the bad guy is it's revealed later these twist villains right we're seeing more and more of this um so I, I'm not really sure if we can go back to those simpler times because I think that maybe audiences have matured and evolved to a point where now we really can't go back. We really can't put that genie back in the bottle. What do you think, no, George? You think, yeah, you think we can go back to the to the more simpler era? Is there a market for that, or is it kind of like as as a society, you know, as an audience, we've kind of moved on? I think there is wiggle room for it to kind of go back. Is that Disney's? long-term goal i don't really think so um but at the same time i mean i've i've watched the the documentary uh into the unknown the making of frozen 2 um which is available on disney plus and uh even uh uh all the people working on the film were saying okay i think we're overthinking this i think we're overly complicating this right. because for the longest time with the uh uh, with some sections of the movie, they weren't sure, you know, who was this this magical voice that Elsa was hearing? Was it herself? Was it the mountains? Was it? And then they came to the fact that it was, it was her mother. Spoiler alert, folks! So all of you who didn't see Frozen two yet, um, but at the same time too, you could have something that is too simple, and that's what kind of happened with beauty and the beast all the way back in Walt's time where they just could not get the story properly because basically the original story of beauty and the beast it was basically 
uh, three characters. It was it was Belle, Beast, and her father. And it was basically every night, you know, she would have dinner with the Beast and they would talk and him try to convince her, you know, that, you know, there's more to him. It was very, it was very vague. It was very dull. It was very boring. And it wasn't until um, the late 80s, you know, when they brought on uh, Alan Menken and the the great phenomenal (laughs) Howard Ashman that uh, that they actually adapted uh, a storyline for it after their success with... uh, mermaid so so the 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 items in the home like mrs potts cogsworth lumiere that was not in the original book that is not in the original story that is such a brilliant concept to have the curse kind of go over the entire castle and now you have the items in the house even or not the items in the house but the but the servants or the you know the workers or whatever that they had become inanimate objects and what have you and and that way it kind of gives you like you were saying george a little bit more room to work with as opposed to having just having three characters and just having basically two hours of dialogue between bell and the beast right yes <laughs> basically 90 90 percent of that film is all original it's then, unbelievable then the the full adaptation of the, of the original uh novel yeah I, I think audiences have evolved though i think that you can't really because i know for myself right I don't know. I think that w- I think when you go back to some of the stuff, like if you watch, if you rewatch some cartoons that you used to like when you were a kid, it's it's like it's kind of you know it's not the same because I think that we right. we we're more accustomed now to a different kind of storytelling. Do do you also think too with the way like everything is like so fast paced nowadays? Like with young kids, it's like they just want to get straight to the point. Do you think it would benefit some of the these next generation? to kind of like not really go too full in depth because it, it doesn't really like stay in the mind very, very quickly. Like the, the TikTok generation where it's yeah. like, if it's, yeah, where maybe it's better just to kind of have like the, that's, that's a good point. What do you think about that, Matthew? You think that's, that, that maybe the simplicity might actually be a benefit to this, to this current generation that's used to these very short. Potentially. Potentially. Yeah. That's interesting. George. That's an interesting theory. I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I agree with you, George, though. I don't, I don't think they're going back. Like, yeah, no. I mean, for the most part, I don't think they are. I, didn't, I think they like the, the, a little bit more complexity, you know? But, but then you have, like, here, to be fair, though, look, look, look at the competition, though. Look at, look, at, look at Illumination. Not really complex there. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> not complex at all, to be honest. Like, you know, you have a movie like Super Mario Brothers, which I actually really enjoyed, but that's a very kind of simplistic kind of story, though, you know? So maybe yeah. it could work. I don't know. It, 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 it's interesting. It's an interesting conversation to be had. Um, we'll see. We'll see how it kind of pans out. But uh, next question: Does the age of the audience play a significant part in how deep they think the most is going to be? What do you think about that, Matthew? Should the age play a, a significant part in it? In some cases, yes. Like, let's just say if 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 like me, you've been brought up on having been brought up on Disney animation. If you were brought up instead on franchises like Harry Potter and Marvel and Star Wars, you might end up viewing Disney through the lens of ends of oh, this ain't got nothing on whatever franchise. What well, well, say you, George? I mean, in terms of the the audience. Um, <clears throat> well, I, I do think it definitely plays a factor. Kind of going back to my my statement that the this newer generation doesn't really take the time to really sit down and really. Uh, get into a film like they're not really in fully invested in it because i wonder if it's because of the complexity to it and sometimes i wonder the more complex the film is is that really hurting these animated films at the box office now minus to the fact of like if you take uh minions for example basically you have these three little yellow things that literally that speak a completely different language you don't even know what they're saying but you're interpreting what they're saying based off of their actions right and a lot of people kind of like take not people i would say children i think children would kind of take to that a little bit more because it kind of gives like that um charlie chaplin kind of like s to it where it's like you don't necessarily have to have words but just a lot of actions that's where i feel like the, the newer generation is at but again are these studios going to do that? I don't think so. But I do think, though, it, it does play into factor. Now, for us diehard Disney fans, 
Yeah, I'll, I'll go into a theater and I'll see a Disney animated film. I'll say it right out. I'm not ashamed of it. I'm proud of it. That's what it is. But the majority, the normies, are you going to get a middle-aged man <laughs> that's going to go <laughs> into a theater to see a Disney animated film without no family, no kids? I don't think so. Yeah, it's it's a tough one. I think I think the audience. It's interesting. The age of the audience. Um, I think it's a balancing act. I, I really do when it comes to this stuff. And I think the '90s were really good at balancing it, probably better mm-hmm. than they do now. Um, you know, for example, I've said many times when you, when you have a show like, say, Animaniacs, which is Warner Brothers Animation, that's a show where you could have an adult watching that show and you can have children watching that show, and the children will get a lot out of that show, but the adult will get a lot out of that show too. And they might get different things out of that show, but they're both they, they, they both see value in it. You know what I'm saying? And I think if Disney can kind of hit that sweet spot where it's like it's appealing to adults, it's appealing to children, maybe on different levels, but there's still that value, that appeal there. I think that's where the goal, that's where the, the sweet spot is, you know? Um, mm-hmm. I, I'm a firm believer you do not you do not talk down to your audience, which is one of the big problems I have with the minion movies. Yes. I think it's kind of like this kind of mindless entertainment. I get it, the kids love it, that's great. That's fine, but I think you can make kid movies that don't speak down to your children, though, and, and, and that can be successful. Like I said, Animaniacs is, is a perfect example of that, or Tiny Toons. I mean, these were these were shows, you know, produced by Steven Spielberg. You know what I'm saying? And it didn't, it didn't, it, it wasn't like this sort of like this mindless entertainment. It had it had real kind of humor to it, real, real, real clever, um, you know. Uh, uh, storylines and, and and what have you you know so and, it's, I, and especially the meta too that's put in these films as well right yeah exactly so i think i think that i think that i think that you have to i think as a studio like for disney because that's what we care about you know, pretty much the most here is i think disney needs to sort of tap into that where it's like you want to appeal to children you want to make sure kids are on board absolutely but you don't want to you don't want to talk down to those kids. You don't want to, you know, it, it, where they ought, where the adults in the room are, are, are falling asleep, you know? Um, and, and, and that's what Disney has historically done very well. Even Pixar with like things like the Toy Story franchise where, mm-hmm. you know, all ages get a lot out of it where, you know, go ahead, George. I'm sorry. Oh, no, you're fine. And that's, I, I've said this many times before on the channel and that's where I feel like they're going in the direction with the villains. It's like, I know it, it, I sound morbid saying this, but I, it's like, I love a good, disney animated villain death i'm sorry i do because it it gives such a climactic ending that it's like you have this villain that you love to hate and you just want to see like what is their demise like what is going to bring them down and it's like uh you, you know watching uh sean Yu getting literally blown to smithereens by the fireworks in mulan <laughs> uh watching gaston fall to his his watery grave so to speak off the cliff from the castle you have uh clayton who basically strangles himself to death and hangs himself in tarzan it's like uh scar getting literally eaten alive by the hyenas it's like i can just keep going on and on and it's like i i love watching a a good villain's death because it's like you cheer it on you 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 root for it in a sense because you want the hero to succeed you know you want that you know that that happily ever after ending and even the pixar pixar dived into it too with um the the death of nelson uh no i was going to say nelson months <laughs> sorry not simpsons um uh uh charles months from up and uh hopper from a bug's life so right. it's you know so there's it's that sense of justice right because yes. these, these characters wreak havoc during the whole film and it's like this tragic thing the whole the whole way through and at the end when you see that epic death scene you know, you know this horrible character not horrible character but this horrible person or in hopper's case horrible grasshopper <laughs> yes <laughs> you know, you, know it, you feel like that sense of satisfaction in a weird way it's that sense of satisfaction because justice was served right and, and that was and that was my one issue with wish was because I, literally i know a lot of people excuse me knock wish for whatever reason i still enjoy the movie do i think it's the best disney animated film no i don't do i think that they hyped it up too much to kind of tie it in like this is 100 years in the making absolutely Absolutely. they should they should have not went that route um but 
I'm sitting there watching, and I'm thinking, because I really couldn't tell how the villain was really going to be defeated, and I'm thinking, how is this going to play out? And you basically kind of see him, like, kind of, uh, like, morph into disintegration and then get put into the staff, and I'm thinking, oh my god, it's like they crushed him, and, like, he just, like, went into the staff, and I'm thinking... Okay, maybe Disney kind of went back to that notion. And then you see him in the broken piece of glass, and I'm like, oh, Disney, you just, like, ruined a missed opportunity there. Yeah, yeah. I, I Full disclosure, I still haven't seen Wish. Oh, really? I, I, I still haven't seen it, yeah. It's not on Disney Plus yet, I don't believe. So, I don't know. I don't know. What, it's I not on we... Disney Plus yet, but did they pull it from the theaters yet? I think it's in, like, I think 60... I think it's 65 theaters, 66 oh, theaters. Oh, is it? So not that many. Yeah, I, I, nothing around here has it. But, um, I mean, I want to see it. I want to see it, but uh, I just haven't gotten around to it. So well, once I see it, well, maybe we'll do like a full video and kind of talk about it. But, yeah. no, I agree with you. I agree with you, George. I mean, you know, these these epic villain deaths, it's just – it's that sense of of, of, just, of justice being served. You, you know, it just, it just – in a sick way, it feels great. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> or even, even Gaston. In Beauty and the Beast, mm -hmm. the way he goes, man, that was kind of brutal too, right? And then you hear that like gut curdling scream from him that it's like he knows, like you know, he's he not coming he's back from this exactly, right? And that was, I'm telling you, that's why that movie is so flawless because you have the Beast who was ugly on the outside, but actually a beautiful human being on the inside. Yes, and you have Gaston, who's beautiful on the outside, who's ugly on the inside. There are just so many perfect things with that movie. I'm telling you, it is really. I don't care. Even I don't. I love Walt Disney. I think Beauty and the Beast is probably better than any of the Walt Disney movies. I agree with you. I agree with you. That movie is a masterpiece in perfection. And honestly, I will. I will say this: the Renaissance era would have never happened. Beauty and the Beast would have never happened. The Little Mermaid would have never been that spearhead if it had not been for, I will say Alan Menken, but I'm sorry, those two movies in particular, The Little Mermaid and Beauty and the Beast, that was all 110% of Howard Ashman. Yeah. Not even Tim Rice could could do it. No, no, no. No one can do it. Howard Ashman is a one, a one in a billion kind of human being. And he just, I, I am devastated. To this day, I'm devastated that we lost him so so soon. Yeah. What what a brilliant human being. What a light in this world. And we lost lost him, and it was is devastating, absolutely devastating. What he did for Walt, not not just the Walt Disney Company. And believe me, he he did save the Walt Disney Company. I mean, in so many ways, he did. Um, absolute brilliant human being. But not only that, though, what he what he contributed just to music in general and to cinema in general. Uh, it's just it's so understated and the sad part is a lot of people don't know who that man is no you know and you don't see really anyone aside from i will say um uh the lopez's that actually worked on frozen and frozen 2 they were heavily involved in the making of the movie so it kind of reminded me of of howard in that sense because up until that point you never really seen a uh a lyricist you know, literally be a producer in a sense of an animated film. Right. Is like it was never really heard of. Well, and these movies, you know, these these songs that like Howard did, they were like the tent poles in the story, you know? And there 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 the, there's a reason why the Howard Ashman movies turned out so good. Because he created amazing tent poles. Mm -hmm. And when you have these great musical acts it makes it easier for the story people to come in there. You know? And I think also what made it very unique at that time as well, he was a person that just came off of Broadway. So he already had the Broadway chops before entering into Disney. And he, I love how he incorporated and infused that Broadway style musical into The Little Mermaid, but more so Beauty and the Beast. Like that opening song, Belle, when she comes out of the 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 cottage oh. like in the little town it's a quiet village every day like like it, it just the scope of that film is yeah. like it screams broadway and that's why a few years later they actually did bring it to broadway because and it it's been like, it's it, that was a huge hit too you know, massive hit so it's crazy stuff it, it crazy crazy stuff but yeah just to kind of come back full circle age of the audience it does play a factor but you don't want to get too you don't want to get too bogged down in your in the age of your audience. You don't want to sit there like what 
and I know people are going to give me shit for this because God forbid I criticize, you know, universal, but look, they do great stuff. I'm not saying they don't. We did a video earlier today about universal Hollywood. There was a lot of yes. great stuff over there at that park. We have fun, right? Absolutely. A lot of great. But I'm going to, I'm going to be honest, you know, I'm going to be honest when, when I don't like something, I'm not going to, you know, I don't care what people think. And honestly, You're not gonna sugarcoat it. I'm not going to sugarcoat it. You know, illumination aside from maybe super Mario brothers, for the most part, illumination it talks down to their audience, you know, and and I I think these studios, especially Disney, needs to needs to under needs to respect their audience more, and not talk down to children. Children can handle a little bit more uh, darkness, maybe in these storylines. We've seen it with a lot of the older Walt Disney movies and things like that. So you got to have that balance. You know what I'm saying? You you got to be able to appeal to children on some level, obviously, but you also want to be able to appeal to the adults as well. And and kind of and kind of uh, balance out. Warner Brothers did an amazing job with that in the '90s as well, and, and with their animation department. So it can be done. It can be done. But uh, our third and final topic of the day: a major bone of contention. And there it is. Yes, absolutely, Matthew. Absolutely, it's the elephant in the room. It's the elephant in the room. So for those of you at home, uh, you probably have seen the 100th anniversary um, uh, Disney animated short "Once Upon a Studio." Okay. Now, Matthew has some criticisms of that short, and um, he wanted to talk about, do, you know, do you believe it was underdeveloped for a centenary production? Now, Matthew, I'll let you set the table and kind of explain what you mean by this. Now, let me explain. Now, now everyone who's seen it will have seen the scene with Goofy falling off a ladder and everyone starting to moat back inside in disappointment. And then it's not until I think it's Alana Dale he starts playing "When You Wish Upon a Star" on his guitar, but 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 it but everyone on on start to lighten back up and their morale is restored. What get bugs me, however, quite significantly about it is that there's no explanation about what might have happened if Goofy had not taken the photo because although Goofy wasn't the what was the mo was the clumsy is cat character that. Uh, uh, chances are it may not have been the only reason why everyone started to moat back inside. I recently wrote, um, as you may I know, uh, I wrote my own version of Once Upon a Studio called Version 2.0. And what happens is Cinderella, Rapunzel, Moana and their respective families, including, I should stress, are returning to Maura Morrison as Chief Tui, are watching this scene from inside with pain expressions, and they realise that even if Goofy had not tried to take the photo, something going on with this photo shoot was pretty much inevitable, because everyone on that day was under such tremendous pressure that, that they could easily have just lost themselves. What do you think of that analogy? Do you think the pressure should have been let on more, or, or to drive home how truly important the centenary actually was? Or do you think it didn't really need to go to such great lengths to show it? What, what, what say you, George? I'll start with you, and then we'll kind of go from there. I think for me, kind of going back to what we were talking about as far as like having things a little bit too complex, I, I think, honestly, for me, and I can only just speak for me, I thought it was a, a great balance. I thought it was just enough because it was a short. You know, I think if they were to try to tackle – something like that as like a full length feature or have it maybe a little bit longer where they could have added more stuff in. Um, I think that would have been quite interesting, but I think that the length of what they made the short, I thought that it was, it was enough to kind of get the point out just so they can kind of get, <clears throat> excuse me, everybody kind of in that area and, and what have you. And the, the one uh, character I'm actually glad that they did incorporate, which is a character that a lot of people don't even really know, is the the rooster from Robin Hood. Alana and, Dale. Yes, yeah. exactly. Because a lot of people, you know, whether they've seen Robin Hood or or haven't seen it in a long time, a lot of a lot of times you kind of forget that character because even though he was somewhat of the narrator of that film, but he wasn't like a, a center point focus of that. So to actually showcase him in a in that short it just kind of harkens back to like the older, like traditional time of Disney animation. It's like, oh yeah, that's right. That he was a character in a movie. That's that's really cool. I love those oddball characters, um, that you you don't really get to see too much. Those are the characters I wish that they would get more time because you can basically kind of see and find like all the 
the the common characters pretty much anywhere at any time. So I personally like the um, the uh, the rarity characters, if you will. But as I said, as for me, just speaking for me, I th- I thought it was a good uh, lengthy short. As I said, now to that question, I think if it would have been a little bit longer. Um, or if it would have been maybe closer to like a feature length animated feature, then then definitely I could see that. Yeah, that's interesting. What's your assessment, OG? Yeah. Like, okay. do, do you think do you think my version perhaps for a short took the centennial a little too seriously and was perhaps a little too melancholy for its own good? Um, no, I actually really enjoyed your your version of it, and and I, I actually um, implore everybody at home to actually check out the. We actually did a whole video with Matthew on his 2.0 version. It was a fantastic video. Check it out. I think it was like last. Was it? I think it was like around in January. So yeah, check two it out. Ago. Yeah, it was a couple months ago. But I, I implore everybody to watch that and kind of get the full uh, meat and potatoes as to what Matthew's uh, vision was for this. No, I think your vision. I think your vision was good. I don't think it was too melancholy, or did I? Don't think it took it too seriously. I think I like both. To be honest with you, I, I like the approach Disney took, but I also really like yours, Matthew. I think you can kind of do both. Um, now, the interesting thing, I would agree with you, George. I do like that the rooster stuff because the he the '70s animation doesn't get a lot of love now. It, it, like things like Rescuers and Robin Hood and things like it's kind of they're they're kind of. You know they're not exact. They're not like the top tier Disney films, right? It's not like the princess films and things like that. So they don't get a lot of screenplay. You don't get a lot of it even in like the parks, right? Here and there, tidbits, but not really. That was pretty cool, you know. But Matthew, I really like yours. Also, where you you focus a lot on Cinderella and Rapunzel. I'm a huge Rapunzel guy. I love that character. So um, I like both. To be quite honest with you, now would you have Matthew? I want to ask you a question. Now, would you have so? In terms of the goofy scene, which you would have cut that out completely, correct? In your version? No, no, I wouldn't have cut it out completely. It sits fine with me, but not without the subsequent staircase scene to add a little more depth and, and the audience realizes, oh shit, there is more to it than Goofy's clumsiness. Got it, got it. Okay, that makes sense. That makes absolute sense. Now, Matthew, what would you do going forward? Now, what would you, if, 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 if Disney was watching this right now, let's just say we have a Disney executive watching the show, and, and they're hearing your concerns, your criticisms of Once Upon a Studio. Obviously, they can't change the original short. You know what I'm saying? It, it, what's done is done. What would you advise Disney to kind of do to kind of make make right for you personally in, in regards to this? Maybe, 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 maybe one part. day one day make an extended version. Bring in back all the actors who were absent. Linda Larkin as Jasmine, Tamora Morrison as Chief Tui, Zachary Levi as Eugene, Chris Daniel Barnes as Prince Charming and Prince Eric. Make the staircase scene, give Cinderella and Rapunzel and potentially Moana as well aside the larger role and then and then do the epilogue scene. Okay, that's fair. After the rousing rendition of When You Wish Upon a Star. Well, and now, and now with streaming services, I guess you can kind of do that, right? Because now you can do you could do a, a Once Upon a Studio, and you can have maybe like a like an extended cut or what have you, right? That's not that's not out of, out of the realm of possibility. Uh, Moana surprises me because Moana is like their favorite right now because Moana is crushing it on Disney Plus. I mean, Moana got some some screen time in the short, but not as much as you would think. Now, maybe that's because even shorts, anime shorts, take years to develop. So mm-hmm. maybe there was an element here where the Moana numbers <laughs> weren't quite <laughs> weren't quite available yet, and they didn't realize it. Because I think if, if they knew what back then what they know now, I think we probably would have got more Moana for sure. Um, now, now, Matthew, I wanted to dip a little bit, though, into, speaking of Moana, your thoughts on this new movie, the sequel. Now, they took the... It, they, it they, actually they, looks quite promising. You're, 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 you're optimistic about it? Yeah, absolutely. Because they took okay, so they took it was going to be a series, and now they're going to rework it and make it a movie. Does that concern you at all that it started out as a series, or that absolutely doesn't really... no, it doesn't. Okay, all right. What about you, George? Does that worry you at all that it was a series initially, and now it's going to be worked into a movie, or no concern at all? No, I think I'm intrigued. Actually, I'm very curious to see like if the original concept for the series is going to be the main primary focus of what the storyline is going to be for uh, the, the film. More so, it's going to be because it's it was on such short notice that you know they're actually releasing this. So a lot of the animation, a lot of the, uh, 
I'm for sure the dialogue, everything was recorded, so they're just going to kind of fuse it together. Of course, they'll probably do some cut and pasting to add some more things in there to kind of flesh out the story. But I, I, I do, I do believe that it's going to be what was what we were expecting for the series into the uh, the uh, the film. It actually gives me higher hopes because from what I'm hearing, that the the storyline for the series they said was just too good to not make it a film. That's so. interesting. That's interesting. We'll see, man. And it's interesting right now with Disney. We're seeing a lot of upheaval right now with executives, right? We're seeing Sean Bailey leaving the live action division element of the studio, right? He's, he's leaving. He got fired. Um, We're seeing Barbara Bruce Vaughn taking absolute control of Imagineering. Exactly. And Bruce Vaughn taking full control of Imagineering. Barbara Boza is out. Okay. Now, the dirty little secret with that is Barbara Boza, she came from a company called Gensler, which people were all over her about that, the architecture firm, Gensler. But Gensler <laughs> is heavily involved in the new Universal Texas Park. But, you know, of course, no one wants to talk about that. That's all right. Don't talk about it. You know, don't talk about it, right? <laughs> but, yeah, she's out. And now we got Bruce Vaughn running the shit. You know, and that's great news, you know. But my overall point here with this is Jennifer Lee, you got to deliver Jennifer Lee. The last movie, Wish, didn't do well in the box office. You know, these next few movies, you got to really, you got to deliver. You have to deliver. The accountability train is making its rounds at Disney right now. We got two right now. Sean Bailey and Barbara Boza. Who's next? We'll and see. that's and that's why I th <laughs> I think that's why Pete Doctor is like, you know what? We're going with Inside Out 2. He's like, I'm not <laughs> chancing shit. <laughs> I know, right? Well, maybe that's why Jennifer Lee's like, I'm doing Frozen 3 and 4. I'm not chancing shit. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. Everyone's trying to play a super safe. And in, in, in all honesty, that is probably the, the, the smart move right now when you're yeah. trying to kind of claw your way back up is you want to do like more of the safer bets. Yeah. Once you kind of get a, a, a footing and a little more stability, then you can kind of dip into some more riskier things. And, and to be fair, too, just speaking of uh, Zootopia, because Zootopia is coming out as a sequel. A lot of people are saying, oh, we're getting all these sequels. To be fair, though, they had already kind of made an announcement that they were going to do a sequel. Uh, actually, I, I believe like after the success of the first one, they said we were supposed to get two sequels to Zootopia. Um, so that's not really a, a, a huge surprise that they're doing a Zootopia 2 because... They had mentioned that all the way back in 2016, was it 16? 16, that like after the success of Zootopia, they said they would be working on a sequel. Yeah, no, I know. And it's 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 something to expect nowadays when when a movie does really well. It's, these studios are going to make sequels. What's in theaters right now? Kung Fu Fan, Kung Fu Panda 4. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I mean, it, it, I don't hate that franchise. I think it's a cute character and everything. I actually love. I really like the show at Universal. I think it's a really cute for you show. But yeah, well, why do people only bring it up to Disney? Oh, you're doing all sequels. Okay, yeah, we we got Kung Fu Panda four. We're getting Despicable Me four. You know, it's like we're getting Minions eighty five. You know, it's like <laughs> right. Oh well, today they just announced Mario two. Right. So. Yeah. Uh, you know. Yeah. It's 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 crazy. Absolutely crazy. Shut up, George. <laughs> <laughs> but it was a, a really good conversation today really love having you guys on matthew always a good time brother we will have you on again very very soon yes. um if you can just kind of remind everybody where they can uh find well i'll link his his twitter in the description because there's a lot of numbers in it it's easier if you just click on it but matthew if you can kind of let everybody know where they can find you on instagram you can find me on the insta under matthew thomas muir or one word Matthew Thomas Muir on Insta, all one word. Make sure you follow this man on Instagram and Twitter. Really passionate Disney fan. Yes. We love talking to Matthew. I, Real, go ahead. Oh go no, ahead. no, no, no. I'm sorry. I, I have to say, Matthew, too. When you gave us like your uh, your uh, synopsis and your storyline for your uh, your 2.0, the the one thing that really I think impressed me the most was your uh, your attention to detail. Even down to the, the 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 music, like when you're saying like the the bar notes and the chords, and you were given like all these like right. terminology words, like because I'm not a music major, I don't know anything <laughs> of that. So it's like it was it's a foreign language to me. But I I thought that was very interesting of how you literally broke that down to literally 
bar by bar, note by note. I thought that was very impressive. Well, and that's why, and that's yeah, Matt. That, that's why we love Matthew so much because he he has such a passion for this stuff, as we all do. We all here at OG55 have a passion for this stuff. We don't do this for money. Believe me, not the money. YouTube doesn't pay well. They give you that much. Not, not, <laughs> not, not, not. Trust me, it does not. We do this for the love of it. You know what I'm saying? I mean, it's, it's, we, I, all of us here are lifelong Disney fans. We've been literally talking about this stuff since we were, we're since we were young. And now we just happen to do it in front of the camera, you know? And, and, and Matthew, I think that's why you fit in here so well is because you have a passion for it like we do. And, um, it's, it's fun. It's fun to hang out with you and, and, and kind of, um, you know, pick your brain on this stuff. So yeah, I was also impressed, Matthew, with, with your with your version of 2.0 of Once Upon a Studio because you you went down to like yeah, like what George was saying, like the various notes of the music, and you you created crafted this whole um, kind of alternate uh, storyline. Really, really cool stuff, man. So and even I, down I, to the casting, even down to the casting, exactly, exactly. And so I do. I will be linking actually our our Once Upon a Studio 2.0 video from a couple months ago at the end of this video. So after this video, after the K-pop uh, girl with the straw, <laughs> stay after that. <laughs> and then his his link will be right there. Uh, click on it and watch that video. It's a really good time. And you can hear Matthew's version of this, um, of of his, of Once Upon a Studio. Really, really good stuff. But gentlemen, I wanna thank you so, so much for watching um, or for joining me today on this episode of The Orange Nerd Show. And I wanna thank everybody at home for watching this episode of the Orange Nerd Show. Thank you all so, so much for watching. And as always, have a wonderful, wonderful day. <laughs>